Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Silvio. Uh, I've been working at Spressif for a few years now. And today I would like to talk uh, to you about uh, how to enable uh, multi-image uh, support on Zephyr uh, using the asymmetric multiprocessing approach. Okay. Uh, the main idea of the talk today, uh, I would like to talk about the Zephyr project in Spressif's maintainers. So there's Joseph just a few people working on that, about the SP32 development status as well. Uh, then talk about the multi-image support, AMP, how it works, and I prepared some, some demo in here that I would like to show you, uh, run through the code, and talk about the next steps when it comes to SP32 support and asymmetric multiprocessing. So uh, the first SP32 commit on Zephyr was back then in 2017. Uh, it was at release 1.9.0. And from 2017 to 2020, uh, Espressive ESP32 was uh, only supporting I2C, UART, and GPIO, just those uh, peripherals. And when you build the application on Zephyr, it, the application was like working only from RAM. So it was not in Flash, was not like executing in place. So then Espressif uh, joined this team, and we have started contributing to the project like since 2021. And this is like the first uh, public talk I have about this, so I'd like, like to, to show who are the team working with Zephyr right now. So Lucas Tamborino and Marek Batei, that's here, uh, they're developers for this project. Uh, Ricardo Tafas is the project manager. So he works with us and also with internal Espressif's project, and me, Silvio Alves. Okay. But of course, all the efforts that we have been like applied on supporting SP32 was not only by ourselves. So I really need to thank the TSC members uh, for all the support that we had, all the discussions, even public or private discussions, and also the community. We have a lot of commits from the community to like fix bug fixes, uh, bring new features, so this is really helpful for the overall project. So when we started working on ESP32, we just took a look of all the peripherals we had, and the first uh, ESP that we like started supporting was the, the common ESP32. So we added support for most of its peripherals, uh, including Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Uh, we are still missing a few of them, like I2S and some harder crypto functionalities. After ESP32, we started working with ESP32 S2. It's a single core version, only with Wi-Fi. Then we started working porting ESP32 C3, and then nowadays ESP32 S3. So this is the current status of the development by June 2023. Uh, we have been also started uh, working on port in ESP32 C6. That's the latest uh, module. That's the one which has the first uh, Wi-Fi 6, uh, first uh, SOC from Spressif that supports uh, Wi-Fi 6. And we have started working on this, so soon this will get uh, a PR on Zephyr. So uh, back again to the motivation about this talk. So why Moch Image and MP? So when we started working, on porting SP32 on Zephyr, uh, the first thing we did was enabling SMP, symmetric multiprocessing, because it should be easy, and it's kind of easy to implement. But then when we started working with uh, the dual core and SMP, we found ourselves like stuck on issues related to kernel awareness, especially on the network and Bluetooth stack. So if we, we enable both cores to work as SMP, then we started having issues with the Wi-Fi and the network stack and the Bluetooth stack, so it wasn't kind of working as we expected. This like was more than one year ago, so this probably has been updated. Um, anyway, but that, back that time, we started looking on the AMP approach. The AMP means that we wanted to have two different apl applications, each one running on each core, so that was a different approach from SMP. So that was one of the reasons that I'm talking about MP and the reason we started supporting this. So why multi-image MP? First, when you work with MP, 
So we have two different applic applications. So it's really possible that you can increase your product performance, either because you have more processing uh, power to perform some specific task or some algorithm. So this is like, for me, it's uh, a really uh, good motivation, product performance. Another one is uh, you can use the CPUs for different scenarios. So one CPU for low power and the other CPU for like some DSP algorithm in a high power usage. Then uh, we can put the networking Bluetooth stack on a CPU just to handle all the networking content, which kind of takes a bunch of processing and the application running on the second core. So uh, it allows us to uh, put some services running on a specific CPU, some services that occupies a lot of CPU processing. And of course, we can also use multiple firmware architecture. So we can add on CPU zero, for instance, some Zephyr application running Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And the second core, we can have some bare metal or some FreeRTOS uh, application. This also can improve like real-time operations and critical applications as well. Uh, when it comes to critical applications, we even start to think about some kind of critical safe certification. But this is something we still like are kind of far away to, to get this, to get into this, but eventually this is kind of in our roadmap as well. Uh, finally, some examples of the usage of the AMP support is like motor field oriented control or sensor, sensor fusion algorithms, which takes a lot of CPU processing. So having this in a specific core detached from other like uh, network core is really an advantage for the, the product. Also, if you're working with uh, some HMI, uh, some human interface devices, or image handling, or camera video, so you can put all this image uh, processing dedicated on a CPU. And also, if you're working with machine learning or AI algorithms, it's also a good approach as well. Well, um, how it works, how the MP works on, on Zephyr, on the overall context. I'm not, I don't like to dig in too much deep on this because uh, explaining how open MP works like takes a lot of time. So I, I just put everything on a single slide. But the idea is when I have two CPUs running different applic applications, you got to have a framework that handles the communication between those two cores. So in Zephyr, uh, we op use the open MP framework. So open MP stands for open asymmetric multiprocessing. So in Zephyr, if you want to do this kind of communications between two different CPUs, you can enable the OpenP feature. It's a framework. Once you enable the OpenP framework, uh, it's going to bring the, a message protocol, like, like the ARP message. It's remote process messaging. So the ARP message is also a, a kind of a framework, and it allows you, that's the framework that you use on the code itself, like the APIs are there. So, ARP messages are those APIs that you add into your code to consume and to send data. Okay. So ARP message uses uh, a Mac layer. It's called Virt.io. So the Virt.io is the library that uses uh, that are used to allocate packets uh, using ring buffers and some kind of uh, synchronization methods. So that's like the Mac layer. And then Virt.io uses the IPC, which stands for Interprocess Communication, as physical layer. And in Zephyr, the IPC is implemented as IPM, so Interprocess Mailbox. So in case of ESP32, if you just uh, open the Zephyr uh, RTOS code, you're going to be able to find that IPM underscore ESP32.c. So it's the same for all the other vendors. So this is the place that we put our custom vendor functionalities. So finally, uh, every time a core sends a message to another CPU, what happens is that the IPC is respons responsible to notify the other core about the, this new data availability. Okay? That's where the cross interrupt occurs, and that's what we get all those callbacks uh, telling that we got new messages from the other endpoint. And finally, uh, the IPC is implemented over a, a shared memory. It's a run shared memory. And with cross-core interrupt uh, 
functionality. Well, basically, that's the whole idea behind the OpenMP and cross-core communication. Okay. Regarding our implementation for the MP support in ESP32, we have some uh, guidelines we are currently implementing. And for instance, uh, the, our IPM or IPC is it happens over shared memory, so our RAM memory is partitioned in three different regions. So we have a dual core CPU, so core number zero uses a part of the flash. The CPU number one uses another part of the flash, and the IPM uses just a small part at the end of the partition. It's like 16 kilobytes of uh, run data. Okay. Uh, currently, uh, Although we are talking about the same ESP32 module, which has two cores, to have this working, uh, we need to face that each core is a board or SOC. So although ESP32 is an SOC, for Zephyr environments, we have to tell Zephyr that we have two different SOCs in there, one for CPU number zero and one for CPU number one. The reason is that the way Zephyr works right now is that we have to have linker scripts uh, for each CPU to define the memory region and all those uh, alignments and flash region and all those data needed for on the linker script. Another second important information is that currently peripheral sharing is not possible. So it means that if you are using I square C0 on CPU number zero, you are not allowed to use the same I square C peripheral on CPU number one. So at this moment, it's not possible. So Architecture awareness is required reg regarding implementing both uh, applications. Finally, CPU number zero executes from flash, and CPU number one application that we call remote application uh, still works from RAM. And we have been working also on MCU uh, multi-build support. Uh, so it means that MCU is going to, is responsible for booting both applica applications running from flash from XIP executing place. So this is ongo ongoing development and will be, will be submitted soon. All right, so this was like the explanation about the reasons to work with AMP. And now I have here a setup that I just created to, to exemplify that. But before, let me tell you how, what we have here. So for this demo, we have here, a, it's an EMA 23 step motor and also a driver for the motor, and a ESP32 S3 box light device. This box light device uh, contains a display, it says ST7789 display over SPI. It has three buttons in front. It has also microphone and speakers uh, to use for voice control devices, but we are not focused on that right now. Uh, ESP32 S3 is an SOC, it's a dual core extensor uh, CPU, it works at uh, 240 megahertz. It has 16 megahertz of flash and also internal uh, 512 kilobytes. It also has external uh, RAM, eight megabytes, which we can use like to put some display images, big arrays of data, and a lot of, lot of different things. So this is the architecture that we have been using here. What's our focus on demonstrating the asymmetric multiprocessing? So, uh, you can see there is this ESP32 S3 whole module. Okay, we have on the left side the CPU zero, uh, and on the right side the CPU number one. Okay, so on the CPU number zero, we are enabling the Wi-Fi, which is going to connect the Wi-Fi of the event, which will use some MQTT interface to perform some publishing and subscription. We also have a USB-C connector on the box light boards. This ESB, USB uh, works as a CDC uh, for logging and also for flashing and use it in debugging. And we also have the display uh, over the SPI peripheral, which will show the temperature and the motor speed, RPM. On the right side, we have the CPU core number one that we consider the, uh, the remote application or let's say the critical applic application which has a smaller footprint. It doesn't have like network enabled. It's just like controlling the motor and measuring temperature and handling buttons. That's all it does. 
So it's a small application, like with a very low footprint. So CPU core number one, it has a modern interface over Let's see peripheral, which is a PWM peripheral. The speed control of the motor uses these three buttons over here. These three buttons is over ADC, so it's a, a raster array. And the temperature sensor is connected over I2C, which is that uh, SHE3D sensor. And for logging the data from the core number one, we use the UART peripheral, okay? And as I told before, the way to make both cores to talk to each other is over the ARP message framework, which is part of the OpenMP whole context. And they share the same memory area using IPC signaling over cross-core interrupt, okay? All right, so how I build the project. So first of all, uh, I created an out of three project from Zephyrs, and I added the CPU project sources. So this is a picture of it. So Summit is the name of the, the, pro the project. Then we have a keyboards and all the source codes, and then the semic lists, kconfig, project configuration. Then I added the remote folder, which is another Zephyr project. So these are two different Zephyr projects which also have the boards overlay, source code, semic leashes, project configuration. Uh, I was questioned before, okay, but how does Zephyr handles building both applications? So the answer is currently on the main CPU zero project, like the master project, we have to add this information on the semic leashes. So when we build the CPU zero application, the CMake lists uh, have the information that it should first build the remote application. So it builds as a Zephyr application. Um, okay, now talking about the CPU zero uh, project. Okay, CPU zero project, it has a Zephyr overlay that I define all the chosen interfaces. I enable Wi-Fi, IPM, USB serial interface, and I added the display peripheral. I also have here, oh, okay, for the display, I've, I've been using the LVGL library. So for me to add contents, I also create a splash screen. This splash screen is the image of the USS uh, picture. You will see that later. So this is an, a binary array with that image. And also here, all the source code. So we have the Wi-Fi services, MQTT services, an API, the main file, and the display API handling. For the CPU number one project, we have the same overlay, but for that CPU number one, where we define all those chosen interfaces, like I2C, ADC, PWM, and UART, and the source files. We have the main source file, buttons, handling, temperature sensors, handling. Okay. So now I'd like to show you uh, just a demo of how it works. Um, I'll show the demo first, then I show some logging, logging content, okay? Let me try to find, so, okay. Uh, this is the step motor, and this is a very, very simple display, okay? I'm not a UI designer, so I just add some gauge in here, some temperature sensor values, a label, and Zephyr Summit title, that's all, so. If I press, uh, this button is to decrease speed, this button to start and stop the motor, and this button is to increase speed. So if I start the motor, that's going to run. I can decrease the speed, okay? And also I can see the proper RPM on the, the main screen. Not sure if you can focus on that. So yeah, you can see the RPM, I can increase and decrease this, okay? It's also possible, oh, sorry. Let me try to focus a little bit, but not sure if you can see, but there is a, a temperature sensor over here. Um, yeah, no way I can make this work better than this. Yeah, okay. So if I put my finger on the temp temperature sensor, you can see that it's going to, yeah, you can see that, right? Yeah, sorry, i can not able to focus properly. Yeah, so you can see the temperature sensor over there. So this is the setup, and what happens in here is that 
Yes, Peter Chu is working again with both applications. Uh, one application is measuring the temperature and controlling the motor, and then updates the other CPU about this information. And the CPU zero is sending these meshes over MQTT and also updating the display. Okay. Uh, now, let me show you some some real-time operation. So, I have here the terminal. So, this terminal is the logging message from CPU number zero. This terminal on the right side is the message from CPU number one. This is uh, MQTT, I'm using Mosquito, pro, uh, software from, from the command line. So this is receiving message from the test.mosquito.org. And on the right side is where I'm going to publish some information. So I'm going to reset the board so we can start all over again. So I just reset it, the, the board. You can see in this screen that we are like uh, connecting to the Wi-Fi. So it connected, I mean not connect, yeah, it's connected, got the IP address, connected over MQTT, and it's completed. So core number zero is like using Wi-Fi and it's connected to MQTT. And below here, it started publishing those messages. If I start the motor, then you're gonna see here that the speed is changed. I can decrease it. I can put my finger again on the temperature sensor to increase the value over here. So it means that the core number one is sending message to core number zero that's publishing those messages. On the right side, I'm just logging uh, the temperature sensor that's been measured in real time. And last thing that we could implement less is that we could send some MQTT information to the core number zero. Like if I send this message, hello, Zephyr, and I press enter, core number zero is going to receive this over MQTT and over FI, and we could like handle this information to control the motor or control the, the any kind of peripheral that we, we want to. Okay, uh, that's all. Let me show you a bit of the, uh, the code. So I'm not sure how many of you has been working with Zephyr. I'm gonna just try to sh show a little bit of the, the code here. And okay, so as I told you before, this is the whole project. We have here the source code for the CPU number zero, which implements the display, uh, MQTT services and Wi-Fi services. So it's a very simple code. If you take a look on the main code, I just wanted to show you two different things. The first one is we have the main code here. Is it too small or you can read it? Okay. So you see here the main, uh, the main function here. So once the CPU zero starts, it awaits for the CPU number one to to start, so once the CPU one starts, it sends a remote message to the CPU number zero, number zero that it's alive, and then Zephyr application on core zero starts. So what we do here is just initialize Wi-Fi, initialize MQTT with a callback, and then it just keeps maintaining the Wi-Fi connection. So uh, if it's connected, connect to Wi-Fi. If connected, Wi-Fi connect to MQTT. If Wi-Fi is still on, keep publishing messages every every second. That's all. On the remote, on the CPU number one, the main code is also very simple. We just start the temperature sensor, the motor sensor, we create some callback for the buttons, and we just keep uh, looping every two seconds, measuring the temperature, and sending this information over the RP message to the CPU, CPU core number zero, okay? Uh, now the most important thing about this is how do we enable the OpenMP in the ARP message um, services? So on the main code of the CPU number zero, we have to do two things. The first one is, this is all the necessary code. So first we just create this uh, system initialization function that registered the, this endpoint, so this is going to be called and we call the ARP message service to register this endpoint. So this is going to tell the whole OpenMP services context that this CPU number zero, zero uh, is live with the ID called demo in this case. So the same code is added to the CPU core number one. It also initializes this endpoint. Uh, in here, I added the same name because I'm not using, in fact, this value, but it registered the same, uh, this, the ARP message endpoint. And 
both procedures are enough like to perform the communication. So every time that CPU number one send a message to CPU number zero, this callback is heated, and I have here all the information and data from the core number one. Okay, so it's just a it's a protocol mechanism with a callback for each uh, for each side of the application. Okay, and last thing I would like to show you is about the project configuration. So, so in Zephyr. We enable most of the features using the project.conf file. This is where we enable all of those uh, necessary libraries to have it working. So for the Wi-Fi, we enable networking, all the net uh, packets, the size of the packets. Uh, we enable a bunch of stuff related to Wi-Fi. But when it comes to the OpenMP support, we need to add those three lines, which is we want to have the ARP, ARP message service enabled and the core number zero uh, is not the slave one. So the same configuration is added to the core number one project. We add the ARP message services and that's remote and that it's not the master one. So that's the way we enable the whole ARP message library to perform this communication. And finally, uh, as I told you before, both projects have this overlay file. So for the core number one overlay uh, to allow the cross core interpreter to work, we have to select these chosen options here on Zephyr. So this tells us that uh, Zephyr is, is using this shared memory area and using these IPC services. So that's one of the things that we have to do to enable this kind of feature for both uh, CPUs. Uh, the rest of the file is like, it's all the UART information that we have to add and uh, with pins we have been using, bound rate, and uh, let's see PWM, and all over peripherals necessary for the core number one. Well, yeah, that's it about the code, that's it about the demonstration. Now let's return to the presentation. Uh, so, what are the next steps that we have to do regarding SP32 support on Zephyr and AMP uh, content context? So, when it comes to ESP32 related stuff, so we are aiming to to add um, multi image support in using M MCU boot, so we can uh, let both applica applications to run from from Flash. We still have to handle uh, the shared memory region and linker script because currently at this demonstration, both linker files are like hard coded. So we just set what's the range of the RAM for each one. So that's not like a good way to do that, but it works. Also, uh, ESP32 S3 module has a peripheral called world controller. So this peripheral is a feature on the ESP32 S3 that you can manage uh, peripheral access permission. So you can do something like this. So this is CPU number zero. So I square C access is only allowed to CPU number zero. So this feature, this peripheral allows doing this kind of control. So it gives you some manner like to avoid any kind of crashes because both CPUs are using the same peripheral. And also we have to work with the evaluate how flash and cache access is going to happen during multi core usage because if both cores are accessing the same flash area, so this is probably going to crash. So we have to create some uh, locking and syncing mechanisms to, to make that work. Finally, uh, there is also an issue open on GitHub. Uh, I think Marty Bolivar was the one to bring that. It's called Better Support for Multi-Core AMP SOCs on Zephyr. And there he brings three fronts, which is device re-updates, and hardware models for MP, SOCs, and build system. I agree, these are really important points that we have to address to get the whole MP solutions on Zephyr to make it easier and more elegant, let's say like that. And I think that was it. That's everything I had to, to show you. I hope like you, you got the idea regarding the working with MP and multiple CPU usage, okay? You have questions, guys?
Yeah, go on. I, 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 I can repeat, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that we are trying to move away for the uh, help message service. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a legacy now. Uh, yeah, so uh, why? Because we have a new subsystem in place now in Zephyr. That is the um, uh, IPC subsystem, really. Okay, uh, so with the IPC subsystem, you are basically abstracting away uh, any uh, notion related to transport protocol, which are your, uh, so you can write your application in a way that is very generic, and you can basically hook up uh, whatever backend uh, you want uh, to do the real IPC, right? Um, and with the IPC uh, subsystem, you can also have a lot of information encoded into the device tree directly without using key config or something. You can define uh, the instances into the device tree. You can have the shared memory into the device tree directly uh, without having to do some magic with, with uh, uh, in the code itself and into key config. Um, so yeah, so maybe you want to look into that because maybe there is also the cache management in there already embedded into the IPC service. Um, so there are a lot of questions that were already solved there and maybe you are interested in that. So for the next generation of, of your yeah, demo. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah. I don't have much to add regarding this, but yeah, I think that there are plenty of space like for improvements overall. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, for uh, any multi core SFC sharing memory and peripherals, um, there is a need to coordinate access to those shared resources. Do you guys have such mechanisms? And uh, are there any constructs in Zephyr? That can abstract them. You mean you're talk? I couldn't. I couldn't listen. Pretty much. You're talking about uh, accessing same peripherals using both CPUs or same resource in a generic sense, uh, either shared memory or a peripheral or a or a resource such as a register that may be of interest for both applications. Yeah, if we take a look on Zephyr itself, we just use like mutexes for that, right? Which is um, my understanding working if the concurrent threads are running on the same core, but if the two threads run on the separate cores, how do you envision abstracting the synchronization between them through a mutex? So you're meaning that let's consider that, that we have two, one thread working on each CPU, two threads, right? Say your networking core okay. is passing packets to yep. be utilized by the application core and yep. the ring buffer, and you need to move the pointers in a deterministic manner yeah. so that the process of pushing and getting data need to be coordinated. Yeah, as far as I know, this is part of the OpenP uh, framework, especially also on the IO interface that we have all this, those ring buffers that where the messages like, are added, and you, like, you just get it from the other CPU. So, for example, uh, it's possible to work with Nordic devices using the CPU Netch Core for the Bluetooth stack, and then all those um, HCI meshes comes from the CPU Netch to the CPU, the app CPU. So this all goes th through these APC and uh, OpenP mechanisms. So as far as I know, all this, this, this question related to synchronization and remote access, it's all embedded on the ARP message and VirtIO core uh, libraries. That's what I know until this moment. Thank you. Uh, a nice presentation, thank you. It's uh, useful for me also. <laughs> so uh, just a question, how do you start, maybe I've missed it, how do you start the secondary core? So. Uh, you have a primary core, this starts uh, uh, Zephyr, and this one uh, also starts the secondary core. Uh, it's how, how does it do it? Uh, also with OpenAMP, I know OpenAMP has also remote proc, the yeah. one that it uh, usually starts the secondary core. So Yeah, so current implementation is that the CPU core number zero starts uh, the second core, like during the CPU initialization on the SOC.C file. Uh, before Zephyr enters into the, uh, the, the it starts the, the RTOS itself, so it just starts the CPU number one. So everything now is handled 
in the, uh, in the application on CPU core number zero. However, uh, we are aware of the remote, uh, remote, remote proc, right, from the OpenMP framework, so we shall change to use the remote processing uh, calls. Then we are not going to use CPU zero like to start the CPU number one. This is going to be like handled by the, the framework. But for this demo, we are still using the CPU number zero application to start this core the CPU number one. Okay. I mean, we, we can like screw the code after this presentation if you want to. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Uh, in your demo, you have uh, an application on the CPU 0 which is running from Flash and CPU 1 is running on RAM. Yeah. Why not both on Flash? Yeah, so uh, we have started working on this. Uh, it's, it's already, we have a working version that uses MCU boot. So the problem right now is executing from Flash uh, for CPU number 1 is not possible because we have been using uh, ESP IDF bootloader on Zephyr environment. We also support using MCU boot. And having this CPU number one uh, application running from Flash is way easier when handled by the MCU boot bootloader. So before doing that, uh, we have to add all these implementations on MCU boot, the multi-image support, and then MCU boot bootloader is going like, to perform the proper placements and running the codes in proper areas. So this is uh, work in progress. We have a working version that should be like submitted soon as well. Okay. Then we're going to have like this full MP working as is expected. Okay. okay. All right, folks. Thank you very much. Hope you got everything. <laughs> <laughs>